We're talking today about the thyroid gland and how it is tremendously affected by estrogen dominance and why estrogen dominance can occur really at any age. So even if you're in menopause, you can still be estrogen dominant and that can have a host of symptoms, of course, but also a direct effect on your thyroid gland itself. All right, so first of all, we have to know whether or not we are estrogen dominant. And what we want to do first is test, don't guess. But when you are testing, you want to make sure that you receive all the tests. So we want to look at that total estrogen. We want to look at your estradiol and your estrone. We also want to look at progesterone. We also want to look at pregnenolone. We want to look at your free and total testosterone and your DHEA. That way we can put that all together because they all, they all play together. And yes, of course, we want to look at thyroid function. That's just the no-brainer. This is what I want to look at, though, when we're looking at estrogen. And I know many of you, the question on your mind is, what is the best way to test these hormones? I've heard blood. I've heard saliva. I've heard urine with the Dutch test. My opinion, 100% to start with is serum. Get your blood drawn. Because number one, it's the cheapest way. And we really get a good, accurate picture of your levels just starting there. Let's just start there. Ultimately, if you're still cycling, days 19 to 22 is when we want to test your hormones. If you're not cycling and you are perimenopausal or menopausal, you can test it anytime, anytime. But here's how, here's why we want to look at estrogen and even its relationship to progesterone as it relates and impacts the thyroid gland. So the more estrogen dominant you become, the more your thyroid gland actually shuts down. So think about that. More estrogen in the system, the thyroid gland starts to produce less and less and less T4 and T3. So then the thyroid gland shuts down. The more your thyroid shuts down, the more estrogen dominant you become. And then it's a it's cyclical. One feeds upon the other. So estrogen, we know, is the growth hormone. It tells cells to grow. So it tells your uterine lining to grow. That's what tells our boobs to grow. But it also instructs your thyroid cells to grow. So this is especially important for those who are post-thyroid cancer, where we want to keep that TSH suppressed and we want to prevent future growth. But this is also important when we're talking about thyroid nodules. So even just those little benign growth nodules will grow when you are in that state of estrogen dominance. So we want to check, first of all, we want to absolutely check your estrogen levels. Now, here's the thing. I see progesterone being the first hormone that tanks. So progesterone, we normally see really take a nosedive after the age of 35. Now, some of you who have PCOS, you might find that your progesterone levels tanked in your 20s. But most of the time, we're seeing that about a 75% reduction in progesterone from the age of 35 to 50. So this is kind of your, I mean, even 35, not really perimenopausal yet, maybe, I mean, if you're early, but really, as we creep more and more into our 40s, definitely closer to 50s, then we move into that perimenopausal state. But progesterone can tank early. That can go early. I see testosterone. That can go early in your 30s. So you don't have to be older. You don't have to be even in perimenopause to experience a decline in certain hormones. Now, estrogen only has about a 35% reduction from age 35 to 50. We don't really see estrogen tank until menopause. And even in menopause, we're gonna talk about how it can you can actually still be estrogen dominant in menopause. So if estrogen is only going down 35%, but progesterone is decreasing by 75% during that time, age 35 to 50, then once you hit menopause, you're actually going to see an estrogen dominant state because there's going to be high estrogen compared to progesterone. So I see this question asked a ton in the Girl Fix Your Thyroid Facebook group. 
how do I know if I'm estrogen dominant? Yes, you can look at actually being flagged high in your estradiol, in your total estrogens. Obviously, that's one way. But then another way is to look at that ratio of estradiol to progesterone. Now, some practitioners will say a one to 10 ratio is what they're looking for. Some will say a one to 20 ratio, meaning that there are there is 20 times or 10 times more estradiol than progesterone. If it goes outside of that ratio, now you can be in that estrogen dominant state. So for instance, if you have a progesterone level of let's say less than 0.3, which I have seen on women in their 20s and 30s and definitely 40s, and then your estradiol comes back at 230, that is still an estrogen dominant state because we're seeing that progesterone tank so heavily, but the estradiol is still not quite going away yet. And the symptoms of estrogen dominance are hot flashes. So yes, ladies, as you go into menopause and your estrogen tanks, you can get the hot flashes along with the vaginal dryness. But every symptom of low estrogen is a symptom of high estrogen. So hot flashes, brain fog, depression, anxiety, loss of sex drive, vaginal dryness, weight gain, osteoporosis, and osteopenia. So you can get all of that by being estrogen dominant and by being estrogen deficient. Now remember, you can also be estrogen dominant if you are taking exogenous hormones. So first of all, if you're taking birth control pills, not good. By the way, birth control totally wrecks your thyroid and it's going to make you estrogen dominant even if it has progesterone in it because it's going to be fake progesterone, progestin, and that will downregulate your body's own natural production of progesterone. I see it all the time in every single patient I have that is on birth control. Their progesterone level is that of a postmenopausal woman. It's non-existent because that birth control pill tanked their own production of progesterone. Now, if you're taking HRT, I think you're actually being prescribed the patch or a cream, you're taking bioidentical estradiol or estrogen replacement, even a biased cream, you still want to keep checking your estradiol and progesterone and make sure that your progesterone is balancing out that estradiol properly. And remember, you never want to take estrogen unopposed. So you never want to take estradiol by itself. You always want to have progesterone on board. But you want to look at that balance of progesterone to estradiol. Now, when we get, when we kind of circle back around the testing, where the testing really, where the different testing outside of serum really comes in handy and gives us a lot of information is as you're moving along in your bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So hopefully you're working with someone that knows BHRT, but as you're moving along, you may want to, or your practitioner may want to do a Dutch test to see how you are methylating those hormones. And that dried urine test also gives us a different picture depending on the type of replacement that you're doing. So let's say you're doing oral form of progesterone, or you're doing the cream form of progesterone or you're doing the patch, or you're doing the topical estradiol, we can use that to see how you're methylating those certain hormones, what pathways you're pushing them down. I have a totally separate podcast where Karen Martell goes through my Dutch test and kind of picks it apart and tells me what we're seeing. But it also tends to give us a better reading of your levels as they relate to each other. So progesterone and estradiol. Testosterone, not so much. I also share in that in that podcast that I was on testosterone replacement and the Dutch test showed me at like in the toilet, like non-existent. But then my blood labs came back and I was in the 300s for total testosterone. So not as accurate, but some of us have a, we talk about this as well in that podcast. Some of us do have a gene that literally doesn't I'm not going to describe this properly, but does not allow for the Dutch test to pick up on testosterone and its metabolites. So that's neither here nor there. Some people have it, some people don't. I have it. 
So I have to rely on blood to get the accurate level of testosterone. But you may want to branch out and use different testing methods just, just to see, just to see those different results that come back in. And, you know, we also have to take into account when we're talking about estrogen dominance and its effect on the thyroid, we have to take into account adrenals because our adrenals actually kind of kick into overdrive to make hormones as we age. So when we're babies, when we're young, when we're in our 20s and our skin's all plump and nice, our ovaries are making most of our circulating hormones. So, of course, I mean, that's what happens, right? The ovaries start to produce and the adrenal glands, they don't have to do as much. They really don't have to do as much. But then as we go through life, midlife, it's about 50-50, we get into that postmenopausal range and now our adrenals are taking over the production of our steroid hormones like 90 percent over 90 percent so you can see why supporting your adrenals is so important like when we tell you to do a little bit of meditation a little bit of deep breathing we're not bsing you i promise there's a point there is a biological mechanism there's a biological point to that in reducing and balancing, not necessarily reducing cortisol, because what if we don't want to reduce your cortisol? What if we want to amp up your cortisol? Supporting your adrenals and addressing cortisol issues that point back to adrenal dysfunction, because then if your adrenals, all right, let's tie this all together. So now your adrenals aren't working so well. We have overproduction of estradiol, or we have an underproduction of progesterone, which results in an estrogen dominant state that in turn shuts down the thyroid gland. Now we also know that T3 needs cortisol, cortisol needs T3. So now we're all messed up in that area. We already have a shutdown of the thyroid gland because of the estrogen dominance. We have an increase in reverse T3 because of the damn estrogen dominance. Now our adrenals are all jacked up. Maybe they're overproducing cortisol, maybe underproducing cortisol. That's going to affect our blood sugar. That's also going to affect our thyroid because we know insulin resistance also pushes up reverse T3. Oh, and high cortisol pushes up reverse T3. Oh, and... T3 needs cortisol to even work properly. So you don't feel all like jacked up when you're taking your T3. You need cortisol. So if your cortisol is in the basement and you try adding in T3, you're going to be one of those people that say, oh my gosh, this makes me crazy. I can't do it. You're going to get that icky and sticky feeling. You're not going to be able to tolerate it. So you see how everything is just so beautifully connected, frustratingly connected and why we have to actually address estrogen dominance for the sake of our thyroid gland and for the sake of how our thyroid converts T4 to T3. And if you don't have a thyroid gland, let me speak to you as well. You still have to be concerned about estrogen dominance because you want that medication that you're on to work. You want that T4 to properly convert to T3 without pushing up reverse. So it's also important for you to look at your hormones and not be in that estrogen dominant state. So when I find someone that I have a patient that, that is estrogen dominant for whatever reason, exposure to estrogens, birth control use, low progesterone, we have to do a couple of different things. Number one, we are always going to support the thyroid and we're going to address the low sex hormones. So if you're low in testosterone, we're addressing that. If you are low in progesterone, we're definitely addressing that because that's going to turn around and help the estrogen dominant state. We're still going to be nurturing, loving on and optimizing your thyroid over here because that's the master gland that controls all sex hormones. And even if it is being affected by the estrogen dominant state, we still want to love on and support it and give the hormones to the body, to the cells that they need. Obviously, we want to reduce chemical exposure because so many xenoestrogens are out there in our environment, in our body wash and our lotion and our makeup and everywhere we look, we are being exposed to xenoestrogens. 
pesticides out the wazoo. Reducing chemical exposure is absolutely key. When we come to supplements, of course, there are adrenal supplements. I've talked before in a different podcast about adrenal glandulars and how they literally love on and support your adrenals. I don't necessarily... I don't necessarily like adaptogens or if we're using the term adaptogen, I would even say that adrenal glandulars are a better adaptogen than something like licorice root or ashwagandha. I mean, rhodiola isn't bad, but ashwagandha we know can push it up or down when it comes to estrogen dominance. And we were, were wanting to help the body rid the tissues of that excess estrogen. And I'm just saying this in general, not breaking it down into the different estrogens that we can look at on a Dutch test. We can look at the pathways that they push down all of that, but just in general, I like using broccoli seed extract and dim. And those two seem to work very, very well. Anything that's rich in, in indole three carbonyl. So like the broccoli seed extract you'll normally find in supplemental form. Of course, we can eat those things, but it, it then we have the whole, we, we're circling back to, okay, if we're eating the foods that contain indole 3 carbonyl, that would be like the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts and the cauliflower and the cabbage. And all of those can be goitrogenic to the thyroid. So we want to really cook the heck out of those if we are going to eat them. But just honestly, just um, diendomethane, dim, uh, milk thistle, calcium deglucurate is another good one, broccoli seed extract. So all of those will help reduce estrogen dominance supplementally. Of course, exercise will because estrogen is stored in fat tissues. So that's why, and I'm going to use the guys. I'm totally going to pick on the guys right now to address this. Okay. You see the man walking down the street with a dad bod and he's got a nice little beer belly going on. Well, I guarantee you it's this whole cyclical thing. So if it is a true beer belly, beer is very highly estrogenic actually. So alcohol is, but beer especially So beer is very estrogenic. So what we see is men develop this this beer gut, this beer belly. Those men with a beer belly usually will have lower testosterone levels and higher estrogen levels, and they will be estrogen dominant. It's two things. Number one, the beer itself is causing that estrogen dominance. Number two, that excess fat that they're carrying around because your estrogen is stored in your adipose tissue. So anytime we have excess fat, we are most likely in an estrogen dominant state. So of course, if you can lose some weight, if you exercise, you are going to reduce that estrogen dominance. And the more muscle you build by LHSing, then you are increasing testosterone, you are decreasing your insulin sens- your insulin resistance, you're improving insulin sensitivity. And now your body will better aromatize estrogen. I mentioned the beauty products earlier. You got to go through, you got to do the environmental thing and clean those out because ladies, you just, you put on, and I forget the exact number, but it was published many years ago, back when they were looking at the amount of chemicals and toxins in the umbilical cords of newborn babies. And how many toxins were in, were being passed from mom to baby. They also came out with a number, something like women are exposed to 180 different, and I could be off on this number, but 180 different toxic chemicals before they even leave the house. So that's all the shit that you're putting on your body and on your face. Obviously just supporting the adrenals we talked about before and really looking at your thyroid function. And really optimizing that because if you let that go and that's the master gland that's controlling everything, you're going to be missing a really key component of the whole treatment protocol. 